Amen. Galatians chapter 4. Um, if you look up on the screen, I have that up there for a reason. Let me read the scripture first and uh, then we'll kind of get into the text. Uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse let's, uh, 22. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the woman's by promise which things are an allegory, and that's what we're studying, studying uh, the types and what is called in literature foreshadowing. The shadow, somebody, and if you look up on the screen, if, if you saw this shadow on the ground coming toward you, if you were like on the corner of the building and you saw a shadow coming, you know then that something is producing that shadow and what's producing that shadow is also coming right behind the shadow. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, But keep this in mind. The shadow is not the real thing. It only shows the real thing. Okay? And I won't get into uh, three, well, I might a little bit. Three dimensions versus four dimensions. Two dimensions. If I were to talk about two dimensions, two dimensions means that it can only be this way or this way. That's only two dimensions, okay? A three-dimensional, like me, or like these people up on the screen, they are three-dimensional because they are this way and this way and this this way three-dimensional objects produce a two-dimensional shadow you can never feel a shadow right I mean it's it's there it's real we can see it we can measure it we can explain it but you can't feel it because it's only two dimensions all right so go up one level Everything in the heavenly realm is fourth dimension. Fourth dimensional objects produce a three-dimensional shadow. So when the Bible uses the word shadow, it's not just a make-believe word. It really means exactly what it says. And I'll try to explain. I won't, get, I won't go any more complicated than that because it is... We can't point in a fourth direction. We can point this way and this way and this way, but I can't point into the fourth dimension. I don't know where it is. Okay? And that's, that's, but that's where God is. Anyway. Um, for these things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answer to, to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So there are two Jerusalems. The Jerusalem on this earth is a shadow of the Jerusalem in heaven. Does that make sense? Okay, so when, they, when Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem and they had the sacrifices and they had the Ark of the Covenant and they had the table of showbread and they had the candlesticks and they had all of those things going on every day. Every day there was, there was sacrifices going on. They had an altar. They had an altar of incense which represents prayer. Uh, the table of showbread represents Jesus is the bread that comes down from heaven and it's fresh every day, renewed every day. Um, you have the altar where they burnt the sacrifice on. That was, and it, had, it, was, it was a square, big square thing, it had four corners on it. And uh, so that represented the heavenly part. But anyway, everything that went on in the Jerusalem temple was a shadow but it wasn't 
the real thing. The blood of a goat, the blood of a bull, the sacrifice, if people couldn't bring a goat or a bull or a lamb, they would bring fine flour mingled with oil. If that's all they had, that's what they would bring. They would offer that. But none of that could ever take away anybody's sins. The only thing that could take away everybody's sins was the real lamb in heaven. Amen? Okay? So if anybody says they were saved in the Old Testament by law-keeping, not possible. Just like it's not possible to eat the shadow of a sandwich and be filled. Okay? It's not possible. You can eat the sandwich, but you can't eat the shadow. All right? Um, it reminded me of, we learned about these tall tales when I was in school. You know, Paul Bunyan and Pecos Bill, and you remember those characters? Okay? They said that Pecos Bill had a knife that was so sharp that he didn't shave with the knife, he shaved with the shadow of the knife. That's how sharp it was. And I went, that's really sharp. All right, anyway, let's, let's move on. Um, go, to he, go to, where do I want to go? Go to Colossians. Come on in. Good morning. You're not from China, are you? You didn't bring that virus over, did you? Just kidding. I'm just kidding you. I read this morning um, a family from the St. Louis area just did got get out of China. They've been living there for several years, and they said, we're out because China's got so many people and they're all packed together when the when the guy the husband figured out that that virus was spreading the way it was and he realized how chinese people are all packed together he said we got to get out of here and they just got they just got home it's a he's still there you read that same story i read all right turn to uh turn to colossians chapter 2 galatians ephesians philippians colossians um He's using the word shadow, and we're, then we're going to go to Hebrews, Colossians chapter 2, uh, but I want, I want to kind of expound on this shadow a little bit. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holiday or of the new moon or the Sabbath days. So, um, are we still required... And this is what this verse is getting at. Are we still required to keep the Passover every year? Christ, the Bible plainly says, New Testament plainly says, Christ is our Passover. He's fulfilled it. Okay? So why should we go back to the shadow of, the, of what was real when we've already had the real thing. Why would we go back to the shadow? Okay? And that's what he's talking about. Don't let anybody judge you in meat or in drink. So, when we eat pork, bacon, ham, pork chops, pork roast, uh, head cheese, ugh. Okay? When people eat that, are we breaking the law? No, not if it's received with prayer and thanksgiving because it is sanctified by the word of God and thanksgiving, prayer. That's why we pray when we eat. It is, God didn't change the law. He, I always tell people, he didn't change the law, he cleaned the pig, okay? So now it's clean. Now God has sanctified it for our use, Okay? So should we go back to the dietary laws of the Old Testament? If you've ever watched pigs live their life, you probably would never eat another one, okay? Because they're not clean things, all right? But that's the point. 
He said that we're not going back to the law. Let no man judge you on these things. And um, there's somebody, again, I'm not going to mention his name, but if you want to ask me later, I'll tell you who it is, who came out of this church and has started a law-keeping church. They go to church on, the, on Saturday. They keep all the Old Testament feasts. They eat all the dietary laws. They keep all the dietary laws of the Old Testament. And what they're doing is that they're following the shadow and not the real thing. Let me pull that picture up again. There's a difference between the shadow and the real. Okay? So... That's what that word's talking about. Uh, new moon or Sabbath days, any of the Sabbath days. Now, I believe y'all, I, I, don't, I don't believe it's a good idea to work seven days out of the week. I think y'all to take a day of rest. The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. That's made clear to us by Jesus Christ, okay? And it's part of the Ten Commandments. We don't deny the rest of the Ten Commandments and say the Sabbath doesn't mean anything. It does. Take a day and rest. I do. Okay? But even the Sabbath day was a shadow of something that is coming. The Sabbath day is a shadow of what of Christ's kingdom on this earth, reigning for a thousand years, giving the earth its rest. He's going to give the earth political rest, financial rest, no more bank foreclosures, no more politicians stealing money, no more none of this stuff. Amen? He's going to give the world a rest. He's going to do it for a thousand years. That's a, that's a day with the Lord. Is that a thousand years. And that's the, keeping the Sabbath day or resting the Sabbath day is only showing what is coming one of these days. Now turn to Hebrews 8. Uh, starting verse 1, Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum, we have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, and not man. I, I did touch on that last Sunday. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. And remember, Christ is a high priest, but he wasn't born... A Levite. Tri Christ was not born from the tribe that God said was to be the priests on earth. The tribe of Levi. The third tribe. The third born son. He was from the fourth born son, Judah. So, because Christ is from a different tribe, and yet he's high priest, Therefore, since there is a change in the priesthood, there must of necessity, this is what the Bible says, be a change of the law. So, those who want to try to keep the law, they have to go back to the Old Testament way of offering sacrifices. And again, those sacrifices never take away sins. They never do. Only Christ, the real and not the shadow. So all these priests in the Old Testament, Aaron, um, you had um, Eli, you had Samuel, just to name a few. These were the judges, these were the high priests of Israel. All of those served as the shadow of who the real priest was going to be, and that priest was Jesus Christ. So... Uh, where were we? Verse 4 four of, of Hebrews 8. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example. There's the one typology word, example. And number two, an shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee on the mountain. So, 
God showed Moses the tabernacle in heaven, the house of God, the temple of God in heaven. Showed him the Ark of the Covenant. He showed him the, the candlestick. He showed him um, the table of showbread. He showed him the altar. He showed him uh, everything about it. And he said, Moses, what you make here, I want it to look like what you see up here. But keep in mind, Moses is a type, a shadow of Christ. Moses comes down from heaven. He does it twice. He comes down from heaven with the law in his hand, written in stone. He does that the first time. Israel's breaking it. He breaks the tablets. Then he goes back up to the mountain again. The mountain is heaven, and it's Christ going back up into heaven. Christ is coming again. Moses came down again the second time, and he's showing the second coming of Jesus Christ. So he's the example and shadow of the real lawgiver, Jesus Christ. So it's a different lawgiver, and it's a different law. The first law said you had to obey all the commandments. You had to not lie, not steal. You had to honor God, couldn't have any idols, couldn't have any gods before him. Uh, I almost bought another Catholic catechism book at Goodwill yesterday because I open them up and read them and they make me mad. Because I'd read how they take the scriptures and go twist it to where they make you think God wants you to bow down to statues of St. Joseph. That's what they make you think. And it just, and I did, I had it in my hand, and I put it down. And then I thought, well, if I don't buy it, somebody else will, but whatever. I've got several books of the Catholic Catechism to work with. And when I look at them, I see exactly in in the Catholic Bible, they leave in the second commandment, but in the catechism, they take out the second commandment. You know what the second commandment is? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. In the catechism that they have Catholics memorize, they omit the whole second commandment. And they take commandment 10, divide it in two. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. It's commandment 9, commandment 10. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. That's commandment 10. That's how they do it. It's pretty slick, isn't it? Okay, anyway. So, uh, Hebrews 8, 5. Who serve an example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mountain. Verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. The ministry of Christ is more excellent than Moses in that if you broke one of the commandments, like committing adultery, what was the penalty under Moses for committing adultery? What was the penalty? You were, you were killed. You were killed. You didn't get a chance to do it again. You had, if you had two witnesses that said they did it, you were stoned to death. No mercy. There was no way that you could get out of it. So now here's Christ. And they bring him a woman caught in adultery. And they said, in the very act. And so when they bring her, of course, you know, we always ask the question, where's the guy? Who knows? Okay? But now Jesus is a different lawgiver. We have a new law. And he says, he who's without sin, let him first cast the stone. Well, the one who could have cast the stone at her was sitting there, and that was Jesus. Okay? But he didn't. What did he do? Woman, thy sins be forgiven thee. Thy sins be forgiven thee. So you have a new lawgiver who now can have mercy on whom he wants to have mercy. And aren't you glad 
that Jesus, this new lawgiver, the real lawgiver, can have mercy on who he wants to have mercy on. I am. I am. Not just for my sake, but for all the people that I know. All the people sitting here, all the people I know online, all the people in my family. I'm glad that I have a lawgiver who loves the people that he loves and he says, I'm willing to forgive you of all your sin. So which would you rather have? The shadow, which is the Old Testament law, or the real, which is Christ and the forgiveness of sins. Amen? Hebrews chapter 10. And, and if you go through uh, Hebrews chapter 9, um, he talks about the first covenant, divine ordinances, the sanctuary, the, the most holy place, the mercy seat. Uh, uh, let's see here. Let's look at chapter 9 just for a minute. Verse 10. No, go back to verse 9 because it uses the word figure and we're studying typology. And it says, All of those things which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Now, I've got something here where it says until the time of reformation, which is the time we're in now. There, it's a reforming of how God deals with man. A time of reformation. Now the old law is done away with. The shadow has passed. And now we have the real, which is Jesus Christ. And if you check the other translations of Hebrews 9, verse 10, where it says, until the time of reformation. You know what you're going to find there? New order, new order, new order. What does that sound like to you? New world order. Modern translations, check it out. Uh, the Christian Standard Bible, the NIV, the New English Testament, all say the same thing. Anyway, back to this. Hebrews 9 which I had my notes in anyway, I forgot about it. But anyway, uh, verse 10, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. I've been a part of this building since I was eight years old. I'd hate to lose it. But if I lost, if something happened, this church burnt down, we're still the church. Okay? God does not dwell in temples made with hands. So he dwells in this temple, the reformed temple temple of God okay this is the real this is the shadow of the real uh, more perfect tabernacle not, not made with hands verse 12 neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us let me explain that there was a daily sacrifice there was people who were coming to the tabernacle bringing their sacrifices for their, for their sins and their family's sins. And those all were offered. Then once a year on the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement, once a year, the, there was a special sacrifice made. There was a scapegoat let out in the wilderness. There was one the priest would lay his hands upon the head of that sacrifice 
discharging all the sins of all the people for one year onto the head of that animal, and then he would be sacrificed. And so all the sins for everybody for one year would be atoned for. But then the next year had to do it all over again. So when Christ came, they took and they placed upon his head a crown of thorns. That crown of thorns represented the sins of all mankind. And he wore it on his head, placed on his head. Okay? Because thorns represent the curse of sin. The sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law. So you have Christ wearing that to, to the cross. He dies on the cross now that all the sins of all mankind have been laid on him, does he ever have to die again? No. Never. Because not only did he die for all the sins that were done before he died, but he died for all the sins of everybody that would ever sin after he died, meaning us. The sins before Christ rolled toward the cross, the sins after Christ rolled back onto Christ. My sins, your sins, everybody's sins that have been forgiven rolled onto Christ. So he dies one time. So why then does the Catholic Church say that every time they say a Mass, they kill Jesus all over again. Because that's what they do. They crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and bring him. In fact, you're in Hebrews. Turn to Hebrews 6 because it says that exact thing. Hebrews 6, 6. If they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing that they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. And every time a Catholic Mass is performed, and there's one, there's one performed every day somewhere in the world, every day. Okay? Monasteries, convents, churches around the world, funeral Masses, you name it. Thousands upon thousands of times a day all over the world, according to them, they have to crucify Jesus Christ all over again for a fresh sacrifice for your sins. But we know that that's not Christ. That wafer they have is not Christ's body. And that leavened wine with alcohol in it is not Christ. That's not his blood. So we know it's not real. They're still keeping a form of the Old Testament sacrificial law in believing that they must crucify Jesus every day. Let me think about it. It's the idea that you sin, so a mass must be said, so your sins be forgiven. How many times can you sin in a lifetime? That's how many times you would have to have a mass said for your sins. Christ would have to die hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times just for you. But the Bible says he only had to do it once. And he did it once. This is where we get the term once for all. We get it from here. Once and for all. That's who he did it for. Um, verse 13 of Hebrews 9, For the blood of bulls and of goats and ashes and heifers, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from, the dead, from dead works to serve the living God? Verse 15, and then we'll move on. For this causes he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Because Christ's blood is eternal. 
Christ's blood then offered there upon the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. And God sees the blood. And every day that blood is still just as fresh as the day it was laid on there. And once you are forgiven, you stay forgiven. Somebody say amen. His mercy is forever, the Bible says. Uh, one more verse, Hosea 12. If you can turn to that very quickly. Um, underline, you could underline this in your Bible. Just make a note. Ezekiel, Daniel, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, chapter 12. This is how God says he speaks. He says, I have also spoken by the prophets, he's, uh, Hosea 12.10, I have multiplied visions. Think about the dream that Pharaoh had. He had it twice, two different ways. The dream that Jacob, or excuse me, that Joseph had. He had it twice, two different ways. Um, trying to think of another situation. But anyway, I've multiplied visions. And then he says, I've used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. Similitudes is something that is similar to this. So as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So you study the story of Noah. Um, other typology of the second coming. Moses coming down from the mountain one time and then the second time. Anything that happens twice. Usually a picture of Christ at his first and his second coming. Um, I'm trying to think of other illustrations and other types and stories. But anyway, you get the idea. This is how God's word speaks. That's why all these stories are there in the Bible for us. This is why we believe then that all of these stories are true and they're real. And... Just because science says the earth is more than 6,000 years old and we've proven that scientifically and we know that we came from the Andatol man and we know that he came from Cro-Magnon man and we know that we evolved from all these over, uh, lower life forms and we have proof of all that. You can believe that if you want, but it won't get you justification with God in heaven. Believing what God said about the creation, about the flood, that'll not only get you justification, it'll also help you understand, number one, what's going on in your life now and what will go on in this world in days to come. Amen. Now back to Galatians 4. That was the teaching on typology, and I could go, man, I could... I, can, I love teaching typology. I love looking at the stories, the different shadows, the different people, trying to understand, God, what does this mean? How does this apply? So Galatians chapter 4, that is going to give us the answer. We talked about this earlier, that we have two Jerusalems. The one Jerusalem, which is Mount Sinai, gendereth to bondage so those who say we need to keep as much of the law as we possibly can in order to please god that's bondage because if i thought that if i thought that god wouldn't do anything good for me if i wasn't good enough for him then I would never think God would ever do anything good for me. But I'm 53 years, I think I'm 53 years old. Am I 53 years old, Melissa? Almost 54 years old. Yeah. So, all those years of life, and I can tell you, that God has been better to me than I have been to him. 
God has done wondrous things with me and for me and to me. Even when I didn't deserve to have any of it done, God did it. And I guess being a minister to people, to tell them it's not a contest about who's better than somebody else. Because I know churches where it's a contest. Who's more holier than thou? Who does more things right than other people? Who's more right doctrinally? Who's more right to the extreme right? Who's more whatever? And that's usually just to cover up anyway. But to be able to tell people who I know Without, you, without knowing everything there, there is to know about you, who I know struggle with sin, struggle with disobedience, struggle with, am I good enough to be accepted by God? God doesn't love you because you're good. He loves you. And when you love somebody, you don't, it's, there's no explanation to it. You just love somebody. You just love them. And they may hurt you. They may not do everything right. They may not say everything right. You might get mad at them every now and then. But you just love them. And the law that we're under now, the real, instead of the shadow, the real law that we're under now is the law of love. God loves sinners. And God loves to forgive sinners and do things for sinners even when the sinners don't deserve to have it done for them. Amen? If your children do everything you tell them to do? Yeah. But they don't. Still feed them. All right? You got to feed them. That's the law. Okay. You got to care about them. You got to put clothes on them. You got to provide for them a stable place to live. And no matter how good or bad they are, they still get something on their birthday and Christmas. Right? Okay? And that's the law that we're under. That's the difference between Hagar and Sarah. And Sarah didn't think that God could ever take a 90-year-old woman and give her strength enough to not only conceive a child, but to carry it for nine months. And I'm watching Courtney and Alicia walk around and, and Jennifer, and they're miserable, and they're young. And here's Sarah, 90 years old, carrying this baby around, but God gave her the grace to do it. And when... And when I'll, get, I'll, I'll be done in a second. When God showed up to Abraham's house in Genesis 18 to tell him, You're gonna, your wife's going to have a baby, Sarah laughed. And then when Jesus called her on it, it was Jesus standing there. She said, I didn't laugh. And he said, you did too laugh. But he said, I'm still going to give you the baby. I'm still going to do it. Did she deserve it? No. Did she get it anyway? Yeah. She got it anyway. Um, yeah. Next, uh, next Sunday, we'll talk a little bit about persecution. You guys pray for me this morning. I just, I'm just one of those days where 
devils are just making me, I'm, I'm depressed is what I am. No reason for it, just am, okay? So if it happens on Monday, it's no big deal. I can hide from everybody. It happens on Sunday. So maybe it has something to do with the message I'm going to preach this morning. I'm going to preach on lies and truth. Okay? So it's going to be a heavy one, so you pray for me and help me, help me preach it this morning, all right? Heavenly Father, I come before you today, and I thank you for giving me the grace to stand here this morning. Thank you for these people, Lord, that you've sent here. I pray, dear God, that you'd bless them. Let me be a blessing to them. And let them be a blessing one to another. Thank you, God, for sending them all this way here. Pray, Father, Lord, that you would uh, open up our eyes and teach us, dear God, just how much you really do love us. The law that we're under, the covenant that we're under, that covenant of grace grieves your heart when we sin, and we will get a rod over it. But you still forgive, and you still have mercy. And God, none of us have ever deserved that, and we never will. So Father, we thank you for having mercy on us. We thank you for loving us. Bless your people this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen.